This is the Hour of Awesome with Robert, Chris, and Steven. This isn't the hour of neat, cool, or rad. It is all going to be awesome. All right, folks. Uh, let's welcome you to uh, Hour of Awesome, episode 13. I am not your host, Steven. Uh, with me sometimes is Chris and never is our fake Robert, which is Jesse down here. <laughs> yes, Jesse, hi. Um, Robert will uh, not be available tonight given his children's situation or child situation where she has uh, had not the best night, I guess. So we have Jesse pinch hitting from our sister's show, Six, thing, six Strings and Things. I cannot speak to that. <laughs> Does that make it really difficult on purpose here? Yes, it's got actually a really long title too. It's Six Strings and Things, A Guitar Adventure. Yeah. Don't forget the colon. Oh, the yeah. colon is very important. How, how do you represent the colon in the actual introduction? That's a little kind of Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. <laughs> uh, those of you who have only been watching us, uh, I know our Bruces are big fans of us, uh, may not have actually been aware of our Six Strings and Things show. Um, it's very focused for those of you who are interested in, in guitars, ranging from those who really want to start out at the very beginning and not having any idea what's going on. Uh, to those who've been playing, such as uh, Chris and Jesse, for many, many years. Uh, Jesse, as I heard, you have, uh, let's say, more than, well more than a decade of experience and well more than a, a, a dozen guitars, if I understand correctly. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so both of them are well uh, are good experts on this, uh, um, on playing guitar, learning about guitar and so forth, which I know that Okay, well, one person is an expert. One person has a guitar in the background for those watching the show. I love the air quotes. Yes. I think the air colon will be the new air quotes. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I can see this catching on. Yes. We need to trademark the air colon. And this is this is how Jester Cat's going to start making money. Yes, yes. Uh, every time anybody wants to use that in uh, real life, you have to send us a penny. Absolutely. <laughs> and if we see it on a video, we're suing the hell out of you. <laughs> In fact, every time you make the uh, the air colon, you have to have a trademark after it. That's right. <laughs> the air trademark. <laughs> Uh, so this is the introduction as well. Jesse, um, although we've been doing uh, 12 episodes before this, Jesse has been more focused on the six strings and things. I'm not sure how much uh, he's been listening to our show. I know, I know how popular we are that Jesse hasn't been uh, drawn into it, but it's a pretty demanding role just being in the six strings and things. Uh, just because you have to keep working on that colon, colon. Cool. Um, <laughs> I want to put up with colon, me. which is a little bit more challenging. So <laughs> And he has to put up with me too, which is pretty challenging as well. So, uh, Fair enough. Fair yeah. Enough. So normally we talk about what we've been doing this week. Uh, so Steven, what have you been doing this week? What have I been doing this week? That's an awfully good question. Uh, this week was much less fun than last weekend. Last weekend I got back to Raleigh, uh, North Carolina for the first time since 1997. That seems to be quite a while. I uh, had a lot of fun, did a little work related stuff, did a little bit of, not work-related stuff, given the uh, amount of the bar bill, as it were. Um, <laughs> but it was a good time. Actually, it was a little work thing that, that was actually quite fun that uh, I don't get to do a lot. A um, little conference kind of a thing. So that was that was kind of a cool experience. Yeah. Raleigh's cool, too. It's uh, a neat place to go. Yeah, like I, said, I, I haven't been there in well over 15 years so yeah it's, uh, it's changed interestingly enough <laughs> i was there last in 2012 I had a conference there uh the world didn't end so we had a conference you know okay. and uh is what it was so uh jesse I'll, I'll ask you in a moment what you've been doing this week but i'll give you some time to think and uh <laughs> <laughs> and talk about it. i uh just actually wrapped up another week being a bachelor uh my wife was uh out in utah on uh business trip so it was a week of you know slim jims for breakfast gas station fried chicken for dinner <laughs> uh, it's been a good week although i i might be swearing off the uh the gas station fried chicken because it was really salty again and uh i don't know the last two times and so i might have to find another uh bad food for me yeah. what else would the other gas station serving at the moment Oh, that's a good point. I should check that out. I should probably just do some casual, you know, just walk in, look around, see what kind of food they have under heat lamps. And 
you know, find something good. My mom emailed me and said that I should stop eating the gas sta- um, gas station fried chicken. She's like, that couldn't, that's probably not good for you. And I'm saying, I'm certain it's not good for me. <laughs> I'm also certain it's not the worst thing I put in my body either. So it's uh So there are Michelin stars. There is a Gat guide and so forth. Well, you apparently yeah. need to have uh, one step beyond the diners, drive-ins, and dives where you're moving directly into gas stations. Oh, yeah. You know, Chris's Eats, a guide to <laughs> the gas station cuisine of the uh, the Northeast. I think that is, yeah, that has to happen. Well, you know, just get on a motorcycle and ride around and you think you'll be all set. Th- this could be the next Jester Cat show. <laughs> <laughs> gas a very station. odd podcast <laughs> at that point. Uh, here we are at a gas station. Okay. <laughs> Walk around with a little mic. Excuse me, sir. Would you serve me some fried chicken? Right. At a scale of one to ten, how would you rate this fried chicken? You know, it's like random people in a store, you know. <laughs> one of my favorite places to uh, go when I was in grad school many years ago um, was the first bar in East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, right, because it had been a dry county for a while, a dry town for a while, um, and they put this bar in a long time ago. And it was famous for the fact it had uh, uh, one beer that was thirty-two ounces. And, um, they, well, they only had Bud and Bud Light came out of the taps and they would fill out a boat, which is, which is nice. Uh, but then they decided they wanted to have food because other people had food. So they began that whole process by having the little processed cheese wraps things, Amer- you know, American singles along with crackers. So that's what you could get in the wraps. The year it is, you could open it yourself. Later on, they figured that that wasn't enough. They need to upgrade. Now they don't have food preparation in the place but there is one place that actually has water in the the uh, bar the bathroom so they installed the deep fryer in the bathroom so you could have anything you wanted deep fried in that bathroom um <laughs> wow so this seem to fit your interest there chris it had the best bathroom fried chicken you're gonna get in this country i don't know <laughs> slogan too it'd be like we cooked the mm out of it you know? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> oh you you can say shit we you just can't drop the f-bomb that's yeah. the only thing you that's when we get the explicit tag on the uh on the uh, podcast but yeah i don't know i think i'm too good for bathroom fried chicken <laughs> there's a line for you there's a line the line in the sand it's right there <laughs> I don't want to be eating fried chicken, you know, made by next to somebody taking a dump. You know, it's just not. I think they moved everybody out when they had to go to the bathroom. It was fine. Excuse me, sir. You'll have to hold it. We have to fry something. It only takes a minute. Don't worry. Right. Right. That would be that would be excellent. Yes. Yeah, so uh, that's that. That's a different experience. Jesse, now you've got the yep. setup. What would you like to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, my brain has been on vacation. I was on vacation last week. So my brain is just totally. Ah, uh, it's like I went to the beach, except I didn't go to the beach, which darn it, you know, um, and then I started a new job this week. So all filling it with new stuff, you know, um, so I haven't been able to think uh, pontificate upon the universal questions like bathroom deep fried chicken or. <laughs> you know, you're thinking about it now and you will be for haunted uh, I, about it I'm, for weeks. <laughs> may not sleep tonight i will have dreams of you know instead of sugar plums it'll be fried chicken there you go. <laughs> you know, compare the fried chicken you've read in your life that's, that, right. that's fair um, chicken plums <laughs> <laughs> we say you know they, they say the life stressors you know getting married having a kid changing jobs and moving well you know you've had one of those four you know you feeling stressed out or relaxed um I'm pretty relaxed actually which is not a good uh, comment on the last job that I had because I was so stressed that almost anything was coming down. So, so it is relaxing to just get out. All right. Yes, I absolutely. That. I appreciate that. All right. Well, I think that's our background on what we've been doing. I guess we'll move into our super happy fun time. I play the music right now, but our our producer Robert has is obviously missing, and thus we will pretend there's songs. You'd like to I, along I can do it. All right, that is our uh, super happy fun time segment brought to you by Bad Humming. I wouldn't call that humming. You'd like to be good at it, but you can't be. Yes. Buy my book on terrible humming on sale now at Amazon.com. This week, uh, we were going to talk about Big Trouble in Little China. The first thing that Robert has ever suggested to watch that is watchable 
Uh, however, Robert, of course, is not here. This is some plot to actually never review a film that anybody else would ever actually to want to watch. Uh, for those of you who have never seen Big Trouble in China, probably it's a bad sign. Uh, it's a classic in every possible way, given its ridiculous nature. It stars Kurt Russell as Jack Burton. He is a trucker driving a nice big rig throughout the movie in many different parts, uh, who gets involved in sorcery and the Chinese underworld. If you can put all those things down uh, in L.A., I believe, this is where this is set. Um, I think so. San Francisco, yeah. maybe? San Francisco. I think Let's so. Go west yeah. Coast. Yeah, you know, this. it opens with the Golden Gate Bridge, I think. Okay. So, yeah. That makes sense, yes. Yeah. So, set in the West Coast, an area of the country I know nothing about. And by I mean West Coast, I mean anything west of Illinois, because I am truly an East Coast kid. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about this movie? Uh, you know, you're right. It was the first movie Robert has recommended that was watchable. I mean, <laughs> you know, Wanted Dead or Alive, crap. Terrible. Lady Hawk, better than crap. Yes. But not as good as Big Trouble in Little China, which kind of is sad, actually. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it was a good movie. I had a good time watching it. I, I uh, last week, no, two weeks ago is when we decided we were going to watch this. And so I told my wife, like, listen, it's on that stream, uh, Netflix streaming. Why don't we just go ahead and watch this together? If you don't like it, we can stop. Okay. Right. I think we made it through a half hour. No. <laughs> and my wife was like, you could tell she was disinterested in the movie. She started looking at her Kindle fire more and more <laughs> and more. And then the phone came out, you know, and I was like, this is clearly not interesting to my wife. So I said, we just have to stop this. And she's like, mm -hmm. so we stopped it. I watched the rest of it the following night. And Did you put uh, on Hamlet 2 for at that option at that opportunity. No, I should have done that. Yeah, I didn't think about that, you know. Um, so I but. I thought the movie was good. Um, I think it's it's kind of a fun mix of sort of like this, you know, trucker and then sort of this Chinese mysticism and sort of the outlandish, you know, bad guy and these fight scenes and all that kind of stuff. It was a good time. Yeah. Terrible special effects. Very pulpy. Absolutely. You know, that, that yeah. had that oh, yeah. kind of feel. There's nothing real in the movie at all. Um, you know, you never Are you got telling me the guy that blew up at the end was not real? <laughs> <laughs> Those were amazing special effects. That's exactly how <laughs> something like that would happen. I always did watch the film and think, boy, did they steal that character from Mortal Kombat from this? Or what was it? Oh, you know? yeah. He was Raiden. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of lightning and stuff going on. And yeah, that that was it was crazy. Um, it had some it has obviously some famous people in it, right? I mean, Kurt Russell is a star and um, Kim Cattrall uh, was also in there, which I had totally forgotten until I put the movie in. I was like, hey, that's Kim Cattrall. Well, she uh, was famous for all of the bad 80s films. She was in Manic. Right. You know, she was in the first Police Academy. I mean, she was very good at Porky's. that time to be in those sort of classic -y films. Was she in Porky's? Yeah. Yes, she was. Oh, I forgot that. I remember that movie um, because my mom was like, we'd go to the, the video store and my mom would specifically say, you're not allowed to see Porky's. So, of course... <laughs> I you would have see Porky's, <laughs> right? Right. But you know, at that age, you don't have your own video card. So how are you going to get access to that movie? This is like, you know, kids, this is before the internet. So, I mean, it's not like you can go BitTorrent and download the movie and see it when your parents aren't around. Right? right. So I was pretty much stuck in this limbo of not seeing Porky's until like I was in college and I could get my own video card. I could get my own damn movies. And so Porky's was like number one on the to be seen list. <laughs> damn. That was a disappointment. <laughs> I well, by that it. time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Grown a few more brain cells. Yeah. If you're over the age of like 13 or 14, you've kind of missed out on the value of it. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so I didn't know. I forgot she was in that. And then there's also uh, James Hong, who's in a lot of uh, movies, actually. In fact, he was in uh, Fifth Element, which we watched. He was the guy that uh, piloted the the Chinese food ship that yes. went up to uh, Bruce Willis's apartment. Uh, yeah. And he's been in, he was in Kung Fu, the legend continues. Uh, he's been, a, I mean, if you go through his list, it's been a lot of things. And it's, it's this guy that you were watching a movie and you say, Hey, I've seen him before, you know, and I can't remember where I've seen him before, uh, but it's been quite a few different things. Yeah. Modern day, that'd be like a, a Luis Guzman or a uh -huh. straight hair. Buscemi was that guy for a long time, but now he's actually, you know, having his own TV show, I think, has ruined that thing. He's too too big for himself at this point. Yeah. I mean, he can't be a bit actor at that point. But, yeah. yeah. 
or it could be Clint Howard. He was in everything. Yeah, right. Sure. Every Ron Howard sure. related. No, I was going to say everything his brother made. That's for sure. <laughs> so, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say now. Now we sh- should uh, watch the Wraith because that was the best Clint Howard movie ever. <laughs> Well, it can't be worse than One of Dead or Alive, starring Gene Simmons and Rutger Hauer. I mean, <laughs> what's with Rutger Hauer in these bad movies? I don't, we don't know. We don't, you are playing Robert, so you have to take on the idea that Rutger Hauer is the greatest actor on earth. You have to believe it. Huh. You can't okay. just pretend it. You have to believe it in your head that that's true. I okay, I'll work on that. <laughs> it's going to take some effort on my part. Well, you are in a Zen-like stage, changing between jobs. So <laughs> that's right. Have some. I like Rutger Hauer, but, but boy, he's had his share. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. We haven't yeah. found the good films yet. I've got twenty or so films that are behind it. I've got eight of them that he's bar he's lent to me right now, sitting in my own home office here, just waiting to be watched. And I'm just every time it's time it's it's Robert's chance to pick a movie. I'm like, please not a Rutger Howard. I mean, I would love to get those <laughs> movies out of my office. Don't get me wrong. And the only way they're getting out of my office is I'm gonna have to watch the damn things first. But but yeah, it's just when he said Big Trouble in Little China, I was like, yes, Big Trouble in Little China does not have Rutger Howard in it. <laughs> This is probably Robert's thing. He's going to like, you know, reveal to us that in actuality, you know, sort of a walkthrough in the background somewhere with Rucker Howard or something. Yeah. <laughs> Cameo. That's right. <laughs> background, <laughs> background shopper number seven <laughs> with Rucker Howard. <laughs> or that he like wrote the film, you know, just as sort of an uncredited oh. writer, you know, just some sort of way to, ro- to work Rucker Howard into it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what else do you take out of this film? So if somebody had not seen this film, if they wanted to watch it, why would they want to watch it? What would take them into the film? You know, not your wife, apparently, but what would others want to get out of this? Camp. Camp. Yeah. I mean, unlike the other bad movies, they're like not even aware of their own badness. This one reveled in its badness. I mean, it really did. <laughs> I mean, just the swagger that uh, Russell did. I mean, it was like, it was like, I don't know, John Wayne for the rest of us or something. <laughs> <laughs> he, had his, he had the escape movie just came out right around the same time it was, it was yeah. a great time for him to be sort of that big guy but not really action star but sort of yeah yeah it's kind of hard to peg him as an action star you're right he's in this sort of unclassified right. you know genre if you will of an actor because he's not exactly an action star but he's actually not exactly not in action stars well. iconic action roles yes mm-hmm. but you know that's the thing with him being you know a child star being the child of you know an actor mm. um you know growing up in hollywood kind of a thing i think that has allowed him to take on a lot of roles and, and drop the roles when he moves on that he can do something different what was he in as a kid uh he had all the disney films Really? He was the Disney star. Yeah. So he was in the in the seventies kind of thing, the early seventies or whatever. He was the Disney star. Huh. Uh, he also wanted to be a I guess you don't know the Kurt Russell biography as it were. Uh, no, I don't. He wanted to be a baseball player. Um so he actually played minor leagues and ended up, I think, blowing out his shoulder or his knee or something like that. Um but his dad owned a minor league team in Portland. In fact, a documentary about this is about to come out, I believe. Uh, about this because it was a rebel team because it was a part of the Pacific Coast League, but it wasn't actually affiliated league or something like that. So it wasn't affiliated with a major league team. So all of their players were sort of like um, Jim Bouton from Ball Four. He showed up. They got him in the in the team. Uh, Kurt Russell came and played on the team. A bunch of Hollywood actors played on the team. Um, it was a fantastic thing. They all hated them. Like all the fans loved it. They did an amazing job. You know, they, lots and lots of people came to the to the games. Uh, but they hated him a lot and basically ran him out of town uh, and replaced him with another actual official uh, associated team. But Kurt was a part of that as well. Huh. I did not know that. Yeah, me neither. Very all about useless information. And <laughs> if there's nothing else, this show is about useless information. You know, if the professor thing doesn't work out for you, you could always be the Kurt, the official Kurt Russell biographer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's, that's about it. I'm, I'm tapped out on Kurt Russell. What you have to do then is find name somebody else, and I'm going to be able to add in, you know, that level of lack of knowledge about their life. Okay, so you would be, uh, you could write the book, The Potpourri of Bi- Biography. <laughs> and it rhymes. New, like, <laughs> you could write the new Trivial Pursuit game, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, that's what we played as a kid. Uh, as I could say, my, my <clears throat> brain doesn't work the way the normal people do. My dad played P- Trivial Pursuit, and... 
if he could come up with the first letter, he could come up with the answer to the question. So he would mm. go through A, not A, B. And so he had to put a timer on him because he would just go through the alphabet that way until he could come up with the answer. But what is what happens when you're a kid, you're playing the games and so forth, and they would play men versus women. So my brain works. I can go up with the first letter of almost any trivia question. But the rest of it, not really, which doesn't work as well as you want for searching purposes. So this weekend, uh, somebody was asking a question about a bad 80s sort of boy band, one hit wonder kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I knew the answer to the question with the funny hair started with a K. And it took me literally 20 minutes of searching on the Internet to come up with Kaja Gugu which is an odd thing to have the answer to. And I had it in my brain somewhere, but coming right. up with Kaja Gugu was kind of hard. And also searching by K, boy band, one hit one hundred eighty <laughs> doesn't really work that well. Google doesn't have a search the way that Steven's brain works for some reason. Um, so I don't know where I'm going. There has to be a website out there dedicated to just boy band searching. There. They would have had it. Yeah, yeah. Some kind of like bubble. I think what was it, Live Plasma, where you could put an artist in, like a musician, and, and it would like do this little bubble chart, and it would tell you like who was related to that musician. I can see the boy band thing now. I'm gonna put in Menudo, right? And all of a sudden, new kids <laughs> on the block pops up over here. Or, I don't know. I don't know too many. Uh, You're running out of, team, out of groups, and, so and I'm done. I'm spent. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only boy band that ever existed. Yeah. So we're all done. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So. Uh, Although, you know, speaking of boy bands, I think one of our theme shows should be Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> so, the connection, the Donnie to the Marky Mark to the Mark itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's the after Keanu. Maybe it's Mark. I know, you and Mark are not the fighter for this. You know, he's got his own little theme that he wants around out here. And it's not Rucker Howard. So. Oh, good. That's that's fine. So that really Rucker Howard, Howard. Howard. Could do a Rucker Hour hour and yes. essentially knock out all of the movies at once. That's so it's true. a lot of pain for a week, oh. but we'd be done. Yeah. You might be done for good. <laughs> well, that's true. And that is the end of the show. I, I introduce this saying, please don't listen to this hour. You will not enjoy it. <laughs> I have a bottle of Buffalo Trace that just is looking for an excuse to open. And I think if we do a week of uh, of uh, uh, Rucker Hour, we have the Rucker Hour Hour of Power. And then uh, I think Chris is getting drunk. That's sort of how I think that's playing out. Drunk, and then we probably will go down to the uh, bathroom fried chicken. <laughs> but well, you need to go down to your local gas station and ask them if they can upgrade to move their fryers into the bathroom, and you'll maybe enjoy it a little bit more. So. Gosh, they might do that. I don't want to throw on wheels. Oh, I, I like, just ask them. I like the Rutger Hauer Hour of Power. I think the name pretty much. Well, that's pretty much the good part right there. Right. The Once you got the name the in. The rhyming you're... is what works. So. Yeah. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, you just heard the best part of the show. <laughs> that's right. And now 59 minutes of Rutger Hour. <laughs> well, just every every like minute and a half. Rutger Hauer Power of Hour. Hour of Power. Rutger Hauer Power Hour. Power Tower of Rutger <laughs> Hour, hour, hour. We gotta get the colon in there somehow. We gotta get the... <laughs> uh, so uh, I think uh, I think we're spent here on the big trouble in Little China, which we really didn't talk about a whole hell of a lot there anyway. A movie, it's called Big Little, Big Trouble in Little China. It is very watchable on our <laughs> scale of things we watched up to this point. I would put it definitely in a seven stage. Oh, it's a solid seven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's just because of like the bottom is so heavy on that scale. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I guess we should probably move. Uh, you know, I could always break out my guitar I've got left over from six strings and things if we want to have a you want bumper. A musical interlude? Don't play something that, that's uh, copyrighted, man. You got to make it up on the fly. All right. All right. We'll do. I'm going to do good radio here and uh, just uh, turn my back. Hopefully, this isn't too loud and blows your ears out. All right. Well, so, Steven Saltises, let's go! <laughs> there we go! <laughs> and that, folks, is six strings of things. That's all we oh. really do. <laughs> One note repeatedly, and we're all set. Uh, those were two chords, thank you very much. <laughs> and a... <laughs> Stephen Saltises. So this week, uh, I have prepared heavily for this by 
reflecting on my childhood and saying, I used to watch a lot of television. Uh, I don't know. This is one of those, I think, unique things aimed at a, at a generation. I think people under the age of 20 would not catch the idea of Saturday morning cartoons or the yeah. idea of just sort of sitting around and catching those shows. Um, but I can definitely see two or three different segments of my life when I'd watch sort of different kinds of childhood television. You know, I'm not transitioning into sort of when I started to watch actually good shows. But you could say, you know, the very young stuff, the, the cartoon stuff that I'd watch. Um, you know, definitely watch Transformers and, and the like and the enjoying of that. Uh, and the GoBots. Oh, yeah. That was the yeah. poor man's Transformers right there. I had a lot of GoBots. Uh, I watched Smurfs because you had to watch Smurfs. Uh, Absolutely. That, that kind of a space. Then you transition to sort of the preteen, whatever they're calling that now, tween or something. Yeah. Would transition into Saved by the Bell because... No, you're not a Saved by the Bell kind of person. I never watched <laughs> Saved by the Bell. <laughs> Saved by the Bell. For yeah. those uh, of those of you who wanted to see sort of almost Beverly Hills 90210, but not quite the age for that. Uh, but you'd also, at the same time, you could get your Knight Rider, you could get your A team. Oh, yeah. So you get those three things were sort of the package of sort of the preteen years. And then you'd move into the teenage years where you would pick up, let's say, Seinfeld. I don't, I don't really know. Um, New Heart. New Heart. Uh, New Heart <laughs> I was, a, I was a rebel teenage boy watching Man, New Heart. I don't. My... <laughs> I do remember sneaking on to watch Beverly Hills 90210 because I wasn't allowed to watch it. But uh, mm. I'm not sure I really want to claim that. Other than you know there was Dylan. He was like 64 years old as a as a you know freshman in high school. Uh, it was <laughs> quite impressive. I'm like, wow, that guy's you know going gray. That's uh, interesting. But, uh... So, you know, just sort of a package of things. But that that's my sort of background. We can dive into sort of why this stuff works if after we hit, you know, what you guys actually did. Sure, sure. You know, I watched the Transformers too, uh, as well. I watched G.I. Joe. Oh, Gotta love this card. You know, I mean, no one's half the battle, you know. I mean, I've got actually I can say that a large part of my uh, morality, my personal ethics are built upon the last, say, three minutes of G.I. Joe episodes. I mean, <laughs> a lot of kids, you know, they go to church. Not me. I watch G.I. Joe and I learned about knowing is half the battle. So Shit, that's how making a knife and stuffing into somebody is bad for them. Ooh, thanks. Oof. No, I don't. I Snake eyes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe. Um but I watched, uh, again, we mentioned this in the show before, the bar was really low in my household as to what Chris was allowed to watch on TV. So one of my favorite childhood shows was Night Court. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was great. Love that show. You know, Harry, I think Harry Anderson was uh, the judge. Yeah. John Larroquette was. Um, so why did you bring out the guitar for this, man? Yeah. You know, <laughs> bang. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. I think that's a bass. I think I think you'd have well, to. I, I mean, I see a lot of things hanging on the wall. I didn't know if there was a bass out there. I don't somewhere. have a bass yet. Yeah. Oh, there it is. <laughs> the next purchase is a bass. <laughs> that's next week's episode. You guys have it all set now. Hey, Chris, I got a I got a bass you can borrow. All right. <laughs> so you get your hands wrapped around it. You have to actually abandon the pick because if you're playing with the pick, you're a poor man's guitarist. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, true. And so it. many do that. Yes. It's true. Um, yeah. And uh, so Married with Children. That was another good one. That was sort of uh, early teen years for me, late middle school. Christina Applegate in your teenage years. Yeah, I could see that. <sighs> that was basically perfection right there. You know. I will reflect back on that because that show changed from season one to season two. She went from being a, just a giant slut to being just stupid. Yes. I actually kind of like, I, I missed that. I actually liked her just being a slut. She was actually much more of an interesting character to me. You know, maybe it's because I was yeah. a teenager at the time and <laughs> more interesting, but. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, but I think, you know, you hit on a lot of the ones that I watched because we're about the same age. So that's, Simpsons, that's, if you're gonna yeah, that Simpsons. Before. Absolutely. I mean, hell, it's still on every 20 years plus. They're doing a, uh, a marathon. Oh, are they? X or FF yeah. XX, one of those things. Like you know, everything. Through. That's awesome. 25 wow. seasons of Simpsons from beginning to end. Wow. That might be worse. That might be worth uh, uh, pots and pots of coffee. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, but that'll kick you through like day four. Of That's 10, true. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I also liked In Living Color. I think right. that was more late middle school, early high school for me. Um, TV shows. Those are the ones that stand out. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. What about you, Jesse? 
Uh, well, so my early early childhood. See, I'm older than you guys, so like Transformers, GI Joe. That was by the time those came on, I was kind of out of watching TV or more into the adult like nighttime TV. So, I mean, yeah, Night Court, I like that, and Cheers, and you know, Ellen, the the second defense attorney on Night Court was the girl who sang the female parts in the Meatloaf, uh, Paradise by the ba- Dashboard Light. You're kidding, Marky Post? No, the other oh, one, the Ellen, Ellen, um. Ellen, I can't remember her last name now. I don't remember her. Yes, no. the girl huh. who replaced her. So, um, anyway, so those, you know, and um, yeah, Cheers, Mash, uh, the, those shows. But like, as a smaller child, we had um, there was always cartoons like uh, you know the Warner Brothers cartoons, Looney Tunes, and all that stuff. But Smurfs hadn't even hit yet. They had a lot of live action uh, Saturday morning stuff, and some of them were like superhero things. Like, I don't know, have you ever seen like like the Land of the Lost? Yes, I loved that. And yes, the Marty Croft Super Show with all the little snippets of the most god awful, you know, special effects. And they had a Shazam one where uh, they had you know Captain Marvel and. It was just all, yeah, and it was always the same kind of thing. Like the last three minutes, you got your moral lesson of the week, you know. Uh, but still, Foley, by the way, the answer, Ellen right. Foley, thank you very much. Right, so, um, yeah, so those are my favorite things. And of course, at night, I, I like the superhero oriented sort of thing. So, like Six Million Dollar Man and Incredible Hulk and Wonder Woman and Spider Man and all those. I'm trying to remember anything else that they had. The Incredible <laughs> Hulk. The Incredible Hulk scared hell of me as a kid. You know, like oh, Lou yeah. Frigno Green. I was I was young enough to just, you know, be scared shitless when that guy turned. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh yeah. He was buff. Yeah. Uh so I remember this one show on Saturday morning called Arc Two, which was really neat, where basically it was a dystopian future where yeah, everything was just, you know, busted up. And then these guys went around in this essentially high tech RV and like went from village to village and fixed things. Of course there was a moral lesson and the guy had a jet pack, you know, the, the thing from like the world's fair where the guy flew with the jet thing with, yeah. So he had one of those and cool. it was pretty cool. I think these things only lasted like a season each right. to be honest, right. but you remember them. Land of the Lost was a couple of seasons. That was three, yeah. maybe. I can't remember. I mean, it was like well, at the time I was watching it, I, I'm pretty sure it was syndication. It was like, you know, before the cartoons came on on Saturday morning. Yeah. Uh, there was Land of the Lost. Always loved it, though, because it was that kind of it might even actually be my introduction to sci fi. Kind of. Yeah, it might. It might be. It might be some of my early sci fi, you know, um, and just. Every time I watch a show, it's cool. And then I see the Will Ferrell movie. I'm just like shaking my head. Oh, it's a, what a, how what a lost you opportunity. Lost the, the, your introduction to sci-fi. You were, you know, Star Wars came out in 77. I mean, I'm just saying. Yeah, but I, I was one in 77. <laughs> yes, but by the time you got around to watching Land of the Lost. I was pretty young. Um, I don't know. I don't remember. I told my mother-in-law one time that I only have a 20-year memory window. And so every year I have a birth, every time I have a birthday, I lose another year. <laughs> so that's, you know, damn, I can't remember past like 16. <laughs> you know what? In a year or two, it's going to be better for you. Don't yeah, worry about it. yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Remember those teenage years entirely and be very happy with life. Oh, that's probably. Right. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, that, that is an interesting notion, though. It's sort of that, that transition. I'm curious about this. You know, I, I think it is something about sort of a generational thing. You know, it's it's people who grew up in sort of the 50s to the 80s is, is where, you know, TV, we're, we're, we're marking posts, right? Or whatever you want to call it, sort of cornerstones mm-hmm. to understanding what was going on in the world and so forth. And I think that's transition. I mean, TV is a thing now, but I don't really want my kids to be exposed to the best in television at the moment. Like, there's no chance that they're going to watch a Breaking Bad for, let's say, a long time. Right. Um, mm-hmm. You know, those kinds of shows that I really enjoy also are, are very good in part because of the ambiguous morality you know mm-hmm. you can watch battle uh battlefield uh battle star galactic you can watch breaking bad you can watch sopranos and there are a lot of great things but if you don't haven't developed that sense of complex understanding of the world they're, they're yeah. completely inappropriate whereas yeah, you know right. we're, we're talking about shows that really didn't have that you know, right. A-Team or G.I. Joe, I always considered, you know, G.I. Joe to be the cartoon version of A-Team or A-Team to be the live action version of G.I. Joe. You could create anything. 
MacGyver-esque, you know, from the yep. time period, you can create a oh, thing. I forgot MacGyver. That was like a huge one when I was a kid. Love and MacGyver. speaking of Battlestar Galactica, how about the original series? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. There's that. There's that, that, that. that was the campy side. That was the uh... yes, it was, but it was the only time you could tune in and actually get laser blasts. Of course, <laughs> the same laser blast every week. <laughs> In fact, twelve times every week. But still, why is it always just a blast? Why is it right. a black background? Why is it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're, you're right. The um, it was very black and white. Unlike you know the episode of Battlestar Galactica where. The people that you were rooting for, they get trapped on that planet and they start doing suicide bombings. Yeah. And that episode, I thought, was one of the most powerful episodes of that show because, again, you know, it's this whole very difficult morality thing. And it happened, a show came out when uh, there were a lot of suicide bombings going on. They were very, very much in the news. I mean, they're always going, unfortunately, they're always going on, but they were very much in the news at that point in time. And uh, they, that, that show hit sort of a nerve right there. Right. I'm surprised it didn't garner more media attention than it did. And had it been on ABC, Fox, CBS, right. it would have totally been a shitstorm of media all over the show. Because it was on the sci-fi channel, I think it mostly got written off as stupid sci-fi, right. which is unfortunate because it was actually a very powerful episode. I thought it was a very good show. Kind of carries space. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that it kind of carries the banner that Star Trek did, you know, decades earlier. Because, I mean, obviously a simpler way, and they had to get past the censors of the time and all that kind of thing. But they did in their in, did their best to, uh, you know, comment on the issues of the day. Right, right. But you had, again, you had to be sort of not obvious, and uh, sure, right. George Takei wasn't necessarily trying to <laughs> change cultural stereotypes at the moment. Right. right. Um, today, obviously, that that's a different world than what he's done much more powerful post to Star Trek days. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's it, interesting to see, you know, that, that idea is can you do this or the fact that there is the fragmentation where you can go really niche, you know, mm -hmm. AMC or sci-fi or even going even more niche than that. You know, it's always sunny in Philadelphia is one of my favorite shows on television. And I will say that it is unbelievably offensive to most people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of it is to do that and to basically have characters that, there's nothing likable or redeemable about any of them. They're all horrible people, which is, you know, really kind of an odd statement to say, I'm going to watch a show about horrible people doing horrible things. Mm -hmm. But it's really funny. Right. You know? mm -hmm. So that, that notion, but again, that's, that's the world we live in today. That's not the world of our, you know, rose tinted glasses. It's right. Not. Right. So. And I'd have to like to add to that. Um, after, say, the mid-90s, Saturday morning cartoons sucked. Well, they mostly stopped. <laughs> yeah. so. They mostly stopped. Yeah, I was watching some Saturday morning TV um, this past Saturday. I was at my mom's house, and my brother and his kids were there, and they had the cartoons on for the kids. Oh, my God, I could hardly stomach it. I was just like, God, you got to get Uncle Chris a glass of whiskey here this morning, you know, <laughs> to get him through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it just it was uh and then there was like the tween shows that came on on Disney that were like live action. It's like, wow, just you know, take my brain out, put it to the side, zone out for a little <laughs> bit, because it was just bad, bad. As a parent, bad. I would say there's a wide variety of these shows. There are yeah. the shows that are brain melting. Yeah. Um and there are shows that aren't awful. Okay. Um, Phineas and Ferb. <laughs> Phineas and Ferb, well that's not aimed at kids. It uh, sort of is on the side of kids, but it's not. I mean, so, so yeah, the interesting true. story is that the dad from Phineas Ferb is actually the guy who wrote Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> That's so amazing. <laughs> we're going for a little bit odd in its original construction anyway. The show, so, so for Chris, if, I am assuming you've never seen it. I've not um, seen it. I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. It has the exact same plot every week. It's these two kids, um, Phineas and Ferb, one who's American and one who's British. They're brothers. Uh, obviously, um, because that's why one's British and one's one's American, and <laughs> they basically decide to to do something because they're bored, and generally they come up with some sort of crazy thing, like they'll go and decide to, I don't know, create a uh, interdimensional, in yeah, you know, whatever. Um, their sister always, who's older than them, always wants to get them in trouble because they're doing something they shouldn't be doing, but nobody ever pays attention to her. And so that's sort of some dynamic around that. And them trying to do these crazy things with their friends and the sister trying to get them caught. Now, the other parallel thing is you have the uh, 
evil professor guy who wants to go and take over the world. And no, no, kind of, just the tri-state area. Oh, sorry, the tri-state area. <laughs> You're right. Sorry, to clarify that point, which is more of the ridiculous humor that's in here. Uh, and <laughs> the pet for the uh, for the boys, Phineas and Ferb, is a platypus. Okay. And the pat- platypus, in actuality, is a superhero, or uh, sorry, uh, uh, an agent, secret a agent. agent, right? Um, yeah. So he's always trying to foil, foil the plot of the evil doctor professor guy. Uh, and also, he doesn't speak. And so the the professor, oh, the basically who people who write it are very big on aware of the sort of you know eighties and nineties movies and so forth. So they'll talk about all the tripes. Like he'll actually say it out loud. It's like you know, um, I don't know. You you may have a better option here, Jesse. But I was thinking of something like you know I'm. I'm not going to go, you know, you probably want me to go tell you my entire plan instead of, you know, just killing you right now. Uh, and I'm not going to do that. But, you know, and they get into the whole plan kind of a thing. It's just sort of awareness of all the kinds of things. You know, I'm going to monologue kind of an idea. Right, right, right. Um, so it has a lot of those right. kinds of ideas that, that go into it. Uh, so it's the humor is really aimed at adults. It's, it's really clever. parents who are watching it. But the kids can enjoy it because it's the kids, you know, the, the Phineas and Ferber creating these crazy things and they're like doing fun things. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, action and violence and so forth, you know, in, in a stylized, cartoony way. So it's fun from that perspective. Um, the other thing that's cool time. about it, it's also semi-musical in that there's there's at least one song in every show. The theme song was done by Bowling for Soup. That I really like those guys, for one thing, because they're irreverent pop yeah. punk, you know. And then, uh, but there's always a tune, and some of them are really catchy. In fact, Sarah and I just bought two CDs <laughs> of the music. And my uh, my notification for text is, is Perry's Noise. Okay. So, it's an awesome show. So there is that. Uh, there are those <laughs> kinds of things that are really, you know, you can watch with the kids and yeah. the kids can enjoy it and the parents can enjoy it. So there's some of those kinds of things. And there's the sort of educational but fun stuff. And like right, right. And all that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, the, any of those shows that can really work at two levels work well. I mean, that was always the statement that I made that I enjoyed The Simpsons because it was very sort of lowbrow and actually could sometimes put the other side on top, could put the highbrow. <laughs> right. What didn't right. work for me was the critic, the John Lovitz one, which was always going for the highbrow and all the references were sort of like, you know, 19th century philosophy or something. Right. And it was like, well, just, just bring it down a little bit from time to time, just a little bit. Right, um, right. Or you go to well, the that... guy, which goes in the other direction, which only is just, you know, fart jokes the whole time. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I think that's right. our childhood, as it were, and even our today's childhood, because we brought up the inner child and Jesse, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Let's Thanks. transition to Chris's curiosities with his own. Would you like to play uh, some new notes for you? Some new notes? <laughs> I, no, we'll just, uh, I'll tell you oh, what, we'll just go ahead. Monica for this? this, this sure. you uh, have it sitting right I, there. I would, but I'm not Robert. I'm not going to walk away from the camera <laughs> to, to, to go just, grab something at random and come back. So <laughs> he would notice it. He would just like, leave. Yeah, that's you know, true. Yeah, he's like... just never his own camera. Oh. Uh, nothing but the highest quality podcasting here from uh, Jester Cat. So uh, yeah. So imagine theme music now. All right. Good. All right. Chris's curiosities this week is about something I got as a present um, uh, last week, which was kind of cool. Uh, my wife gave me this thing called a man crate, which is it's awesome, right? So, you know, it comes in this it comes in, you open the box that it ships in and inside is a crate. And on top of that crate is a small crowbar. And basically there's the instructions are just basically open the open the crate. And so it turns out the, the wooden crate is glued together. There's no nails. So you, you use the crowbar. It takes you, you know, 10 minutes to get the thing open. And there's some man related, you know, themed present inside. Okay. <laughs> and they've got different kinds of man crates. I think it's mancrate.com or something yeah, like that's something their website. Up, yep. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> the one that I got was the retro gamer man crate, which has a NES clone in it and two cartridges. Okay. Uh, and also candy. Uh, and actually, I, this is the second. <laughs> this is the second man crate I received. The first one had an Atari, a little uh, Atari joystick with some games that were built in. You plug it to the TV, and you can play the Atari games. Well, this one that she got me uh, has an NES clone, 
and it's pretty cool. Uh, so I've been, you know, hitting up the local used game store here, getting some uh, NES cartridges, trying to find some ones from my childhood. The theme, you know, the childhood theme, right? Um, games to play. I just was there today. I picked up Akari Warriors, which I loved as a kid. Oh, yes. I picked up Time Lord, which I'm certain is broken because I could never finish as a kid. So as an adult, I'm going to prove that it's broken. <laughs> um yeah, it's this game where, you know, you you uh, I don't even know what the point of the game is, except that you run around, and you collect these orbs and every level is like a different part in history. And so it's like a pirate ship level. There's a castle in England in 1250 AD or whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm pretty convinced that the pirate ship level was broken because as a kid, I played the damn thing for hours and never found the fifth orb. And, you know, you get the fifth orb, you get to teleport to the next time period into the next level, so on and so forth. So anyhow, I just bought that game because I want to show that's broken. And then I bought another game um, called Jackal, which is basically a Kari Warriors in a Jeep. And um, disappointing because it doesn't work. And I've read online that some of these clones don't work with all games. And so I've I've read that the one that I have in particular doesn't play Dragon Warrior and uh, one or two. And so maybe Jackal's on that list too. I don't know. I might see if I can exchange it for another Jackal cartridge just to see if it works or take it to the shop and see if it uh, works in one of their, uh, they probably have some kind of NES in there, original NES to see if the, the game actually works. So yeah, uh, a little bit of retro gaming fun. Uh, a friend of mine let me borrow um, Ninja Turtles, the arcade game. Now there's two Ninja Turtle games, right? There was the arcade game, but then there was the one before that, which was really freaking hard. And it was a side scroller, kind of platformer kind of thing. And then uh, that's the one I had as a kid. And then he also loaned me Tetris, which of course everybody has Tetris. And then uh, Battletoads, which of course is the hardest video game of all time. Get yourself some Castlevania. That'd be a good one to bring out. Yeah, I saw Castlevania was in the glass case. So the store has sort of like the every man's games like the poor man's selection that's where i got most of my games today i was kind of surprised akari warriors was there but hey whatever i guess i'm just sentimental i mean that made me the game yeah every person i only had two games well two plus what came so i had the original so i got that well i didn't have the original i had the uh um i had the 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 super mario brothers and duck hunts oh yeah i had that one yep Yep. um my cousin had the one with the little robot thing oh no way the robot was cool moves the thing over and yeah gates and so forth yeah Uh, but then i also had legend of zelda because Uh uh-huh you know everybody's got to play it and then i had akari warriors and that was it i rented the games because that was back in the day you could go oh yeah and rent the games and so you play it for a weekend and that's an entire game i mean most of these games you would knock out in a weekend anyway oh absolutely Mm -hmm. yeah uh but that's it's only only one so i can't speak to Oh, I think that everybody had it. Ultimately, that's the point. Every single person on the face of the earth basically owned Akari Warriors. Yeah. Even if you didn't have Nintendo, you still had Akari Warriors for something. <laughs> like, yeah. For Christmas. I'm like, but I don't I, have this game. I had Akari <laughs> Warriors 2, and there was an Akari Warriors 3, but I, th- I think that was the one that was the side-scroller, which didn't really quite make sense. Um, so you're but the side-scroller, you got the Contra, right? Oh, yeah. So, you know, that's a glass case game. I mean, yeah, yeah any store that has that, that's going to be behind a glass case. They had um, all the Zeldas behind glass case. They had Castlevania 2 behind the glass I thought it was kind of strange. Uh, Mario 3, Super Mario Bros. 3. Of course, that's sometimes considered the best NES game of all time by some people. Um, so they had a pretty good selection there. I'm looking forward to going back and digging through a few more things and picking some stuff up. What was the one that was in uh, The Wizard? The Fred Savage... Oh, I had that damn power glove. That thing was the biggest piece of shit. Oh, <laughs> wow. So the power glove, right? So like Fred Savage Wizard, like, you know, like, oh, wow, this is cool. You know, he's the one, the, the racing game. It was like Outrun, but it Outrun was Sega. There was some other ripoff that Nintendo had. And the guy's like there on the screen going, driving the car with the power glove like this, right? And then there was Mike Tyson's punch out where you could do this. You, it worked by... There were three um, sensors you'd put on the corner of your TV, the three corners of your TV, right? And the damn thing never kept track of the sensors. The games never responded properly. You had I a mean, TV with only three corners? Because what were you watching, man? Three quarters of the four corner television. <laughs> Triangular. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. I'm sorry. It's, it's getting late. <laughs> so you put it on the TV, right? And uh, that power pad was a better accessory than the power glove. Punch, 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 punch. 
Absolutely. You just get on their knees, punch it on the floor, and you could run the the hundred meter dash in the Olympic game in a second. It was amazing. Um, and you could jump four miles in a long jump. It was it was pretty cool. <laughs> but yeah, they actually had the power glove game there at the store. They didn't have the power glove, they had the power glove game. It's probably all the people destroyed their power gloves in like anger or something. A problem. I actually I tell you, Battle Toads was the game that taught me the term rage quit. <laughs> I hadn't thrown so many controllers or in my life until I tell you what I'm looking for though is the uh NES Advantage controller that was the joystick. Okay. Oh boy, that's probably, you know, some serious money there cuz that was like the best video game joystick I ever played ever. It's up until like today ever best controller. Um and I would love to get um a light gun for it, but I don't think it'll work on the flat screen TVs pretty sure it won't actually so anyway um that's my curiosity thing this week old nintendo gaming so if you could get something else if there was a perfect crate what would that be i mean we'll go to you fake robert uh, <laughs> Ooh, the perfect crate for me would be the atari jaguar oh oh ho, ho. and yeah. for one simple reason uh, and that is that I, I th- as I read about it, because I've never actually seen this game. My favorite game as a kid, because I, ha- I again, I'm a little older by, by a month, maybe. Um, so I had the old Atari VCS even before it was called a 2600. And then I got into the, the replacement for that, the 5200, which was the guts of the Atari computers in a video game format, the 400, 800. So you could get Star Raiders, which was cool. And the game I was addicted to for like a year. Um, the graphics by modern it's terrible yeah, yeah, by modern yeah. standards I mean, but, the, but the classic but yeah yeah, yeah. but the gameplay just the feel of that 3d space adventure i mean it was the it was the uh, forerunner of wing commander and and the x wing all that but um and then there was a couple uh, bad knockoffs and copies of that but the one that really did it um and i'm trying to even remember what the name of the uh, uh i think it was like uh, battle droid or something like that. I can't remember what it is. It's a Jaguar game though. And uh, it was only available on like DVD or something or CD. And uh, cause it wasn't an Atari game. It was a, a third party thing. And boy, if I could get a hold of that, that'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you hit the nail on the head back then. Gameplay had to be good because the graphics weren't. Yeah. Uh, the controls I tell you, you know, kids these days, they don't know what controller lag is, but you sit down with one of these old uh, controllers and they don't respond like the 360 or the Xbox One controller. Right. You know, I tell you, a lot of the games can get by with crap gameplay because they dazzle with the graphics. That's you know? true. Um, I mean, back then, it's all you had. Yeah. And, and you, I mean, especially on the Atari, you had a joystick and one button. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go even go the other side. You, if you had a television, you had just a like remote control for your TV with a yeah. thing that you slid over top. Yeah. 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 What about you, Stephen? What would be the uh, retro clone that you would want to have? It's weird because I'd actually would go back to some of the. I, I, I started as a PC gamer. Okay. Right, so I did a lot of that. I had, like I said, I had a Nintendo for an NES for a little while, but I didn't really play it that much. And I had a Sega Genesis, and I had again like two or three games. Um, but PC games is what I sort of grew up on. And for me, I know we can talk about all the various things that I played, all the games that were fun or ridiculous. Um, but if you were a very specific age and you played King's Quest, and you guys are looking somewhat blankly at that game, but it was I've one heard of, of it. it. Yeah, it was one of the first sort of. Um, graphical RPG s games, a very story based. Um, it was by Sierra Entertainment, and they uh-huh. did. They were huge for a period of time. They had oh, like yeah. seven King's Quest games. They had Space Quest. They had Police Quest, Hero Quest. You can hear a theme. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, it was really a fantastic game. Um, it also launched with the IBM PC Junior. So if you're a specific age, it was we have a good computer. And let's make it useless. And so they launched the PC Junior, which had like a cartridge as well as the disk drive. And it was just awkward. They had oh. maps they mm-hmm. put on top of the keyboard so to know yeah. what everything mm-hmm. was, which is quite humorous. But uh, King's Quest was a game that just clicked for me for whatever reason. It allowed me to have – it was not a sandbox game, but it was closer to that than anything else, I think, up to that time. Yeah. And so you got to explore and try things and do things. And some basic interaction and so forth, and then that that was 
that I could probably lose some stuff. I mean, I actually, there, there's a little app you can add to your, your iPad or whatever that can go back to the old text-based game. So you can get Zork. You can get oh, Hitchhiker's nice. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I've actually Sweet. been playing Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the text game. Right. Recently, right. And it's fantastic. Zork, I tried playing, and it's just like, it goes back to those days of like, oh my God, I sucked at it then. Right. And I still am so bad at it. As a full grown adult, I don't I just can't do it. I just kept dying. And I'm like, okay, this sucks. I'm just terrible at this game. I just will not play it ever again. But this hiker's side of the galaxy, it just draws me back into it. Now I'm just thinking I can't wait to read it with my son because I love that book and the ridiculous right. nature of the story. And just as a game, it it had all of that stuff built in for just the sideways humor, but in a text yeah. form. It's like, you know, you just do stupid things. And it would give you ridiculous responses because why not? Right. Um, right. But, like Leisure Suit Larry. Well, there you go. That, that was a Sierra <laughs> game as well. I yeah. 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 A friend of mine had that for his, uh, the computer he had, had the uh, orange and black screen, you know, monitor. Yes, right. Yes, and yes. so to protect young minds from Leisure Suit Larry, there was a quiz you had to take. Well, I was a nerdy kid, so quiz, no problem, you know, at, uh, at a middle school level. What did level. IBM stand for? So, well, both of my parents worked for IBM, so I got that one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there was a handful yeah. of those questions on here. I'm like, I can figure it out, too. Yeah, you. this is not a problem. Even pre-internet days, this is not a problem. This is not a barrier. So then, of course, in middle school was the perfect age for Leisure Suit Larry. <laughs> Again, eight bit graphics, and oh, they would yeah. still put out like the fuzz out if whenever they like you know got in the hot tub or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Like, there's no <laughs> point in fuzzing out. I mean, what were you going to see? You weren't. Going to see uh, you know, the only PC gaming <clears throat> I really did as a kid, uh, we had an Atari 600 XL or 800 XL. I can't remember what the number was. It was a keyboard you plugged into your TV, and it was not even a computer. I mean, you could type words on the screen, but there wasn't even a printer or anything like that. You couldn't do anything with it. I had a, a controller port and a cartridge port. And Minor 2049er and Q. That was a cool game. Yep. Those are the two. Minor was good. Yeah. And I loved Qbert. Uh, but Minor 2049er was just a great platformer. Uh, very difficult. You can go on YouTube and watch people complete that game. So I got to see the ending the other day. Oh, sweet. I can see that now. <laughs> There's no ending. There's no real ending. Like, that's the thing. You, you can see the last level. And the last level had, like, the cannon and dynamite, which I'd never gotten to. Mm -hmm. So... Good stuff. Good stuff all around. I still have a Sega Genesis. I'm I'm not hooked it up, but I'm thinking about bringing it upstairs and hooking it up. <laughs> Nothing Check. better than put that like on a flat screen TV. You know, gigantic. And it's yeah. basically the guy on there is half the screen. <laughs> I guess the altered beast now, you know, oh, this God. is <laughs> Rise from your grave. That's right, right. <laughs> Turn into a, a, some kind of animal. Good stuff. Good oh, stuff. Man, I hated that game. Because <laughs> that was I, I was must have been the same age as you then when I got it, because that was the game that came out before they started shipping it with Sonic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's when I got I had I bought I got the Sega Genesis when it still came with Altered Beast. But there was this promotion where you get Sonic for free if you bought it. You had to send in the UPC symbol, the, the, the system or so I can't remember what it was. And it was like a two month wait for the damn game. I remember that. I was like, two months is ridiculous. But boy, when it came in, that was a little piece of heaven in a box. Good old Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> you could go so fast. That's all you hear is just a ding, 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 yep. ding, 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 for hours. Yeah. Yeah, that, and it's when it turned, when you turn it on, it would go, Sega, which was so cool, because no other game did that at the time, right? It just turned on, you saw the Sega logo, that was all you saw. The, the uh, NHL game, that was, that was what we ended up playing, just for hours oh, and hours. Yeah. I think I had NHL 93, I might actually still have it. Yeah, just, we just play it. And there was always the, the little hooks you could figure out on, okay, well, if you go left and right and left, you would always scroll. Yep. You know, oh, yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah, there's always this. 24 to 3. In, okay. Yeah, those old video game sports games, there was always a way to outsmart the computer. I mean, John Elway's quarterback, you know, it was pass to the sideline, run straight up. You never get tackled. You're winning like 150 to nothing, you know, in a football had, game. For the, for the Genesis, I had this Joe Madden, uh, no, not Joe Madden, uh, Joe Montana's Sports Talk Football. It was one of the very first ones to have sort of commentators that would actually be somewhat relevant to the game. Huh. Um, wow. But I played as Randall Cunningham. And so the, the thing was run a bootleg. Yeah. Every play. Run yeah. a bootleg. And you win. And it was just like superhuman capabilities. Like I threw a pass every once in a while. I was like, he didn't score. Why would I just run the bootleg? Run the bootleg. Naked bootleg. <laughs> yeah. Naked bootleg. Naked bootleg. It's like, why do I keep playing this? Because I keep doing the same move for like 
five hours. Yeah. Well, <laughs> in John Elway's quarterback, it didn't really matter what play you called. Uh, cause you could do whatever you wanted. And uh, the bootleg was another classic in the quarterback game. Cause you could, you could run, you know, some kind of deep Hail Mary pass, do a bootleg and you'd still get the touchdown. I mean, so, <laughs> so bad. My, my idea of football was the original Atari football game. And if you've never seen what that looks like, you got to go to YouTube and find it. Cause man, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to talk about the metal vibrating table that, uh, has oh, a little, no, no, the, little game, the handheld game where you just had like a little guy that was just like on there and then something would come up and you had to like go to the left or the right or something. Yeah. Oh, my dad LEDs. Had that. oh that was my childhood. We had all, all those little LED, yeah. you know, baseball and football. And to be honest, they're probably better than the Atari football game. So <laughs> See, I didn't have an Atari. So I had to like, you know, be excited to go over and play ET, not knowing it was the worst game ever invented. <laughs> yeah, oh, like yes. buried a thousand of those like, they, they discovered them recently some you know video game archaeologist you know dug a hole <laughs> in new mexico and look there's a whole bunch of et Turns games out it wasn't just an urban legend it was actually there <laughs> let's put some dirt back on that no one wants that let's <laughs> <laughs> let like somebody in a thousand years in the future find it and say oh look these people worshipped et they had these cartridges <laughs> that <laughs> oh yeah that's Good stuff. That's, that's how I feel like, you know, when I throw away plastic, I feel like what I'm doing is employing future archaeologists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with that note, uh, I think that's probably the conclusion of Chris's curiosities. <laughs> now that I've offended every archaeologist that watches the show. Yes. I didn't intend it as an offense. But anyway, so I'll go ahead and take us on out of here. So remember, boys and girls, whatever you do this week, just keep it awesome. And for those of you who would normally get the outro music, it's something about Jester Cat Studios, something, something, something. Follow us somewhere and go to our website. Thank and you. like our video. Oh, like our videos that, that's here. Yeah. Oh, do, 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 magic thing. Like our videos. Yeah. Except. Like, I don't know which way it would point because I don't know where I am on the screen, but look for the like and f- click on it. Subscribe. <laughs> click on it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, folks.